Loving, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the opportunity to hear your word and your truth, Lord, and we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you'd open up our minds and our hearts to the words that we hear today and would receive a blessing from you. We give you the glory and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Be seated. Well, we had a wonderful blessing last night as Dr. Rob Shepherd had spoke. What a blessing it was. And he is going to be our speaker again this morning at 9.30. And I believe the topic is Yahweh Jireh. So uh, we're going to find out some more beauties of the Word of God as he speaks to us this morning. Doctor, would you prefer this? Yeah, we'll move it around in a minute. Well, good morning. morning. How is everybody doing this morning? Who was here last night? Most everybody. Well, then, good. This will be kind of short. That's why I wanted to make sure. First of all, we want want everybody, if you don't have one, we want you to get one of these laminated cards, one per person, and it goes in your Bible, and when you come across the name of God, you don't remember what it is, pull this card out, you'll see the spelling, the definition, and uh, what it means, and several texts. So this is one per person. We also have a nice binder. Well, then I'm going to explain it to her because she deserves it. And I won't even ask you where you were last night. <laughs> Just the kind of person I am. So one, you get a binder. This is one per family. And inside the binder is a very nice... How many of you all looked at this? It's pretty nice, isn't it? This is also on the names of God, about 23 of the names. And this should go into your office or the place that you study your Bible. Also, we have a business card inside the binder. And if you would like to share that card with people, you can go to our website, knowinggodministries.com. And on that website, we have about 250 sermons that Rob and I have done that you can download at no charge and listen to. Uh, Rob and I have um, two years of prayer meetings on there. We have about three years of our home church on Friday nights that are recorded and on the website. And we also have every Sabbath our Sabbath school uh, lessons. Rob and I uh, share teaching a class. We have about 60 people in Arlington in our Sabbath school class, and we record those. And so you can listen to the Sabbath school lesson uh, any time that you want to. So there's a card in there that you can pass on to your friends and have them go to our website. And of course, the last thing that we want, one per family, is a set of our 15 CDs, the introduction, and then 14 names of God. These are absolutely free, no charge. As Rob mentioned last night, we have uh, people in the Arlington Church uh, that support our ministry, and they want this message out, and so that's why we have the privilege of coming and uh, sharing these uh, things with you at absolutely no charge. If you, if you were here last night, didn't you get a different picture of what God is like in the story of uh, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden? I used to sell the Bible story, you know, and there's two pictures in the Bible story, and they're great books, but there was two pictures always stood out. One was the angel or God pointing and saying, get out of here, and then the picture of the angel at the garden with that sword. What a beautiful picture Rob presented last night of our father taking both Adam and Eve by the hand, walking them to the entrance of the garden, and tears in all three of their eyes. For you see, they were heartbroken, but God, Yahweh, He was heartbroken. Well, if you thought that story was a little bit different, wait till you hear the sermon by Rob in just a few minutes. Now, I want to mention one thing before I introduce Rob again. Please don't forget at 11 o'clock, 
I have the privilege of doing my favorite name, Abba, which is literally Daddy. Now, I know after your warmth last night that you have a good potluck planned. Is that right? Is this going to be a good one? Well, boy, that, that gets me excited. And then immediately after potluck, I mean immediately, let's come back in here and I have the privilege of doing Elohim, but I promise you that we'll be through in 30 minutes after we begin. That's my promise to you folks. Rob did such a beautiful job last night. This one, however, is my favorite of all of them. The beautiful Yahweh God will provide. Again, Dr. Rob Shepard. Well, it was wonderful to share with you last night, and uh, I get very excited when I have an opportunity to share, and there are some of these names that just burn so badly, and you just have to get it out, want to help people understand what it is. Uh, today is one of those, and uh, if we had an opportunity, it would be wonderful to do another one that's very much my favorite, and that is called Yahweh Sabaoth. Uh, it is uh, a, such a profound name, and, and it's hard to decide which one to do. But this one here is one of my favorites, Yahweh Jireh, God Will Provide. In order to understand this, and I want to share some principles with you, and that's, that's primarily what we're trying to do is to give you some principles so that when you open the scriptures, you will follow those principles right on through. One of them is understanding the names of God, having that little list, so that when you run across any of those names in there, open it up and look at it. I do that every time that I open up the scripture. I keep looking at that name of God. And what is that aspect of God that he's trying to teach me today? Now, God doesn't have all these names and say, well, now, in this situation, you have to call me this, and in this situation, you have to call me this, or you always have to call me Yahweh or Jehovah. That's not what he's after. All of these names, he draws upon every kind of rich illustration that he can, just like he did when he taught in parables. Why did he teach in parables? One of the reasons he taught in parables was, I could never lift up a salt shaker again after he told the parable of the salt. I could never look out and see a man sowing seed again without something sticking in my mind. So he wanted to so interweave these with our mind that every time we came across those, that name, that meaning, that intention of God is emblazoned in your mind. And so with Yahweh Jireh, he wants to teach us something, and I'd like to share with you four principles that go throughout Scripture, and they can be used in any one that you use, that you, you uh, read. Because what he's trying to do is to give us Steps on how this Bible will be unfolded. Many times we look at it and we, we will read a story in the Bible without giving any consideration of really what happened before. And to look at the theme that he's trying to do. And that's one of the things about uh, what we enjoyed was uh, we went through the Bible, the 66 books, but in chronological order. That is, they're not in chronological order. They're not as they happened. In fact, the one that was written first is in the middle of the Bible, Job. And some of the others are written in a progression. And so it really is helpful to understand, understand the context, understand what God is doing, so that he can try to bring across the richness of that message. Now, you don't have to know all of that to be able to gain from the Word of God because God is going to lead us. His Holy Spirit is there to open up His Word, 
You don't need my words to make this understandable. God, the Holy Spirit, is right beside you. And when you ask him to open up your eyes, please feed me from this. Help me to understand. So all you are getting is one man's experience of taking the Bible, using these principles, and it opened up for me. But this is one man's experience. I'm looking at it through a certain perspective, and I guarantee you that's not the only way to look at it. And God will teach you the same way. Remember the walk to Emmaus? I have a picture of that on my wall. I look at it often. The walk to Emmaus, in my mind, is the epitome of all the Scripture. Because everything God had intended, everything He wanted to do, He had done. And here is Jesus walking with these two men. And my picture has his arms around them as they're walking. By the way, one of the men that he was walking with was his uncle. And as they were walking along, they didn't know who he was. He said, why are you so sad? Why are you so downcast? They said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem that you haven't heard what's happened in the last three days? And he said, what? They said, well, we had all these things happen, and we had this person that came, and we thought he was the one. We thought he was God's Messiah. And it said that Jesus did what? He went to the Scriptures. And he began retelling the story from Genesis right on through. And said he opened up the Bible from this Genesis on through and told them the things pertaining to himself. And what was their reaction? Didn't our hearts burn within us as we walk with him in the way? That is what he wants to do with you. Jesus says, I'm so excited to leave. And they said, why? We're going to miss you. Oh, I'm so excited to go. Because the Holy Spirit will come and walk beside you. And when you open this up as a learner, as a child, he promises he will unfold this for you and teach you about himself. And you'll find your heart will burn as mine has burned. So, here are some of the principles that I'd like to share with you about how to understand not only this story of Abraham, but to understand what God is trying to do. And these principles will apply to all the stories that you read. And then I want to unfold as we allow these principles to tell this story. Okay? So the number one principle is found in Deuteronomy 8. And if you will, please turn to that. And by the way, um, all of these things are in the notebook. All the notes are there. So you have everything there. We don't want you to lose a thing. And trying to encourage you to study and get to know him as an individual, as a person. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. We're going to read a, a couple more. In verse, look at verse 1. And all the commandments that I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which Yahweh swore to give to your forefathers. And you shall remember all the way which Yahweh, your Elohim, has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. That he might what? Humble you and test you. 
to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, when God tests, what is that? I know tests. I taught for 13 years on the college campus. I know what tests are. And they're as much a pain for me as they were for the student. But I had to do something because I stood up there and went on and on and on. And then I said, did you get it? And the way I tested that was to see if all that stuff went in their mind. That is not the test God is doing. God doesn't put you in a situation to see if you can take it or not. That's not his objective. God tests in a different way. So let's look at a couple of things about what God tests. Does God have to test to see what is in my heart? No. no. Where do we find that out? Look over in Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And let's look at this principle. O Lord, Psalm 139, verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. It says, before I even think it, you know my thoughts. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, O Yahweh, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid thy hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. What he was saying is that it overwhelms me. What you do, what you know about me. God does not test you so that He can see what's in your heart. God is there taking you through these experiences, being able to try to help you understand what is in there. There is nothing God will do by force. God will never rip sin out of your life by force. God, and this is one of the things I love about Yahweh Sabaoth, that God comes to us and he knocks on the door. And you say, who's there? He says, Yahweh Sabaoth. Oh, well, come on in. He says, I can't do that. Why? Why? Well, there's no doorknob out here. Oh, well, kick it on down. You're the God of the universe. Kick it on down and come on in. He says, I can't do that. I won't use force. I won't use force to gain entrance into your heart. I won't use force once I'm in your heart. I'm your friend. I came to sup with you. And that word sup means he didn't come by for a spot of tea. He came by to live there. Psalm 87 says, My heart is God's path upon which he walks, and he never gets off of it. So he didn't come to knock down the door. He came to ask you, May I come into your home, please? Oh, yes, please come in. And when he comes in, he doesn't come in and say, Whoa, it stinks in here. Look at all this stuff in here. Look how rotten it is. No, we usually do that. We look around and say, Lord, I don't want you in here. Look at my house. Look at my life. He says, I didn't come to do that. I came to make my home with you. I came to be your friend. And then, as he abides in me, all of a sudden, through life, things begin to happen to me. And all of a sudden, I find pride, I find jealousy, I find anger that comes up. And all of a sudden, he and I have this dialogue that's going on. And I say, Lord, that person just really made me mad. He says, I noticed that. 
What do you want to do about that? Well, Father, and so he and I talk together, and all of a sudden, he takes me to the depth of that and find out that I feel so insecure, or I may feel so jealous, or I may feel so prideful. And when he and I discover what that base is, he says, what would you like to do with that? Oh, Father, I surrender to you. He says, now I can work in you to do thy will. It is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's why he's there. That's why he's there. And that's why Paul said, as I said last night, we look around and say, who changed me? What happened here? What's going on? Thank God. Jesus Christ has done that. So the very first principle is God tests us. Not so that he will know, but so that we will know how we are growing and the change that is happening in our heart as a result of him taking up residence in my heart. My sin could never be so ugly that God has to leave. He says, before you ever knew me, I loved you. If sin was offensive, he couldn't have come here in the first place. Your sin doesn't offend me. What hurts me is what your sin is doing to you. That's why I came to be your friend. So that first principle, the testing that God does, is that he moves us from one stage of our understanding and our relationship with him to another stage, to another stage, and to another stage until we stand there and we look totally amazed at what he's done to us. What the grace of God has done in my heart. Please hold on to this. Every story in the Bible is about that. That's principle number one. Principle number two is found over in the New Testament, and that's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. If you'll look at that, please. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Now, look at verse 12. It says, Therefore... Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is not something where God says, okay, now I've built you up, I've built you up, now you can stand on your own. You can do that by yourself, right? Never, never. I am totally dependent upon his power. And then he says, do you know, no temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to all men. There's nothing that we have experienced, but what someone else has experienced. And God is faithful. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Did you hear those words? That is the God of the universe that is talking to you. I will lay no temptation upon you, but what I've already provided the way out. Nothing will overcome you. No one will take you out of my hand. And every trial, every temptation that comes, God's not down there and said, hey, let's throw, let's throw this at him. And let's throw that at him. Come on, let's douse him a little bit. And if he hasn't learned his lesson... Take him through it again and really work him over. If that's your God, I would hate to spend eternity with one like that. There's no temptation taking you, but such all is common to all men. God has already provided the way. 
and he'll never allow you to be tempted above what you're able. And there is always, always a way provided out. And when these things happen, that life and the devil throw at you, our tendency is to run away. But with God, I am a mighty army. When those things come, I say, Father, my heart, I'm full of fear. I'm full of pride. Whatever. I will be your strength. I will be your warrior. I will be your victory. So, second principle is, God will never put anything upon you that's greater than what you can bear. And when you come to the story of Abraham, you need to keep this in mind. Because God can look pretty bad. Next thing. It's found in the same book, uh, 1 Corinthians. And look over at chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 9. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world. What does your Bible say? Mine says a spectacle to the world. What does yours say? A what? A spectacle. Anybody else? Some say a theater. So we are a theater of the universe to show what the amazing grace of God can do in a human being's life that surrenders unto Him. So as we walk through life, as we face these things, the Holy Spirit is there to lead us, to prompt us, you are my child. And as those things hit us and we cry unto God, The world, the unfallen world, are amazed at the grace of God in the life of one who is totally powerless. And to watch this transformation that the character of God has reproduced in the lives of human beings. Oh, the amazing grace of God. Now, the last principle And we've got to get going because I want to make sure that I get to the end. I usually get to talking so fast that I even forget to tell you the meaning of the name Yahweh Jireh. Remember, if I get there and if I don't say it, you know in advance, God will provide. Okay? So let's look at Genesis 22. Genesis 22. I'd like for you to see the very first words that are here. And this is the fourth principle. The very first words. Now it came after these things. What does, what does your Bible say? Oh, I'm sorry. 22.1. Now it came to pass. After all these things, what is that telling you? Everything that came before has laid the foundation for this story. So this is what we talk about with context. Everything that came before shows you what God has done to bring the person to this place that this amazing story will begin to unfold for you. So those are the four principles. The testing. God will never lay upon you anything more than you can take. We are spectacles to the world. And that everything in the Bible always has a context. And we only understand it as we read it in context and see these things unfold. Genesis 22 has been shaping up all the way through. And I want to tell you this story now. And as we look at this story, all of a sudden, if you you skip too far, too fast, 
God is going to look pretty bad. You look at this story about Abraham. And we think of Abraham as this mighty giant of faith. One who was so strong and did so many marvelous things for God. Abraham was an absolute duplicate of Rob Shepard. Fell on his face more times for instance, whenever he took a trip because of a famine and he went down into Egypt, what did he do? Hey, Sarah. Sarah. <laughs> now, Abraham had in his mind that he was going to be dog meat down there if someone wanted his wife. And so he said, Sarah, would you mind when we go there that as I introduce you, I'll introduce you as my sister? I wonder what Sarah felt like. You ever heard the statement thrown under the bus? So here is Abraham, so full of his own self, so full of his own fear, that he was willing to sacrifice Sarah for his own skin. So when we go down there, would you please tell them, you're my sister? And so when they went there... They were attracted to Sarah. And they did say, oh, she's my sister. And so the king was told about her and said, bring her here. And he took her in there. And I'll tell you, that's the worst night that king ever spent. <laughs> because the father said, don't you dare touch her. It is through this one that the Messiah is going to be coming. Don't you dare touch her. Of course, he didn't say all of that. And so Abimelech, got up, and he went to Abraham and said, what is this you have told me? I've seen in a dream that this is not your sister. This is your wife. Why did you lie to me? He says, oh, I'm sorry. In reality, if, if you look at it and trace it all the way around, down the line there somewhere, she really is my sister, but she's my wife. He said, you mean you jeopardized her life? You jeopardized my life? You jeopardized my kingdom? Shame on you. Boy, would you learn that lesson? Would you really trust God in that regard? Did Abraham learn? No. no. What did he do? Turned right around and did it again. That's not all Abraham did. Now, I'm not here to try to deface Abraham. I'm here to try to help you understand. So many times we look at these stories of people in the Bible and we think, oh my, such, such great faith, such wonderful things. That person would just like me. And then you see this marvelous change that begins to occur in Abraham. Who has done this? God has done this. And we see this transformation that comes and keeps continuing to grow in Abraham's life. Abraham is a panoramic story of the mighty power of God in a man's life. It takes him from one like me and transforms him to the point to where he wants to be. And when you understand what God is trying to do in this story, all of a sudden the incredible beauty of God's character begins to unfold. So at night, look at the passage if you would. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. Now by the way, tested him, what is that about? Wanted to see what was in his heart? He wanted Abraham to see what he had done in his heart. And so, tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I, tell, I will tell you. Now, folks, Notice the first, I mean, the last verse of the chapter before. 
What was Abraham's conclusion? It's uh, actually the second to the last one. It's chapter uh, 21, verse 33. And because of Abraham's experiences, this time with Abimelech, and the other experiences he had, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree at Beersheba. And there he called on the name of Yahweh, the everlasting Elohim. There he finally comes to the place, and you never see this in any other passage. Abraham finally came to the place where he says he called upon the name of Yahweh and fully trusted Yahweh, fully trusted Elohim, the everlasting God, who says, I will provide, I will never leave you, I'll never forsake you. He came to that conclusion, and now this story occurs. Because God wants to say something to the entire universe. God wants to say something to every one of us through this story of Abraham. Now, what do you imagine it would be like? Remember, Abraham was in an environment where people offered their children in sacrifices. There are places that they have unearthed where they have found pits of bones of little babies. Thousands. And in the midst of that, God says, Abraham, take your son, who is now 18 years old, your only son, the son whom you love. By the way, where will we ever hear that? Absolutely. You getting an insight in where God's trying to take Abraham? Take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and take him up to the mountain and sacrifice him. If you heard that voice, have you ever questioned that? If God said that to you or said something of such severity to you, would you know it was God's voice? Or would you say, now, wait a minute. I got to get the sheepskin out here and see. (laughs) I got to test him because I don't know. Abraham knew God's voice. Abraham knew God as his friend. Abraham had come to the place where he learned that he could trust his God. And so my Bible says immediately, Abraham got up and ran in and woke up Sarah and said, Sarah, guess what? That's not in your Bible? It's not in my Bible either. (laughs) Guess what would have happened had Abraham gone in and told Sarah, I get to offer Isaac. Oh, she says, yeah, somebody's going to die all right, and it isn't going to be Isaac. (laughs) Abraham never said a word. By the way, it's so amazing when you see this story of Isaac. What a treasure he was. Do you ever read to see what his name means? Laughter. Laughter. Abraham gave him the name of Laughter. And when you look at the story, you see a lot of laughter going on. You see laughter when Abraham and Sarah goes and say, we're going to have a baby. (laughs) They looked at them and said, yeah, right. And they laughed. No, God told us we're going to have a baby. Yeah, we can see that all right. So they laughed. And when Sarah got pregnant, She laughed. But that's not what the word means. When she laughed, they gave the name Isaac. Laughter. Because when that child was born, God realized through that child, he was going to be able to teach those people of his heart. And God takes that little child and holds him up 
like a proud father and holds him and God laughs. Because he knows that the devil has been doing everything he could to try to destroy these people. And now God laughs. The name Isaac actually means God laughs. And so here, you've taken this son, his only son, and it says that he gets up immediately. How did he learn to do that? Do you think he would have done that uh, 40, 50 years ago? Not on your life. And so he gets up immediately and he grabs the servants and grabs a, a, a pack animal, a little mule, wakes up Isaac, and he grabs a knife. He grabs firewood. He grabs fire. And he says, Isaac, come with me. We've got to go and offer an offering to God on a mountain that he will direct. Isaac Learn to trust. Taught by a father who learned to trust. And so they went on. And it says, for three days they walked, and not a word is exchanged between them. But what is Abraham thinking? Do we know what Abraham is thinking? We know from the day that Abraham left that tent And as he is walking in the direction, knowing not where God wanted him to go, that Abraham was thinking. Abraham was thinking. And if you look in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that as he was thinking, Abraham was reasoning. Now, wait a minute. Isaac is definitely an answer to prayer. We couldn't have that child without God. Isaac is going to be the one through whom God's deliverer comes. Isaac has to be alive in order to have this happen. And so Abraham came to the conclusion, I know my God so well that if this happens, God can even raise him from the dead. And so Abraham walked. Do you think that this was simple for him? Abraham walked. No words were exchanged, but the thinking was going on. And finally, when he came upon the place where the mountain was, he looked over and he saw the mountain. And there was like a glow about the mountain. And he turned and said, Isaac, this is the mountain. So they went a little bit farther. And they left the servants, they took the wood, they took the knife, they took the fire, and they were headed up the mountain. For the first time, Isaac speaks, Father, I see the wood, I see the fire, I see the knife, but where's the sacrifice? Would you please look at the wording in this text? And verse 6, And Abraham took the wood, the burnt offering, the laid it on Isaac his son, and took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together, and Isaac spoke to Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide. And actually, in the Hebrew, it says, God will provide himself the sacrifice. Abraham, Isaac made their way up the mountain. And they picked a place. And on that place, they gathered stones and they built an altar. And then Abraham turned to his son. God, I mean, Abraham gave God all kinds of time to say, just kidding. He said, Isaac, you were the sacrifice. 
Compare this. A man over 100 years old. At this time, he's about 118 years old. Compare this to a man who is 18 years old. What kind of strength is there? Oh, tremendous. Isaac could have dashed down that mountain and says, <laughs> forget you. It's amazing. I don't know. All the details are not given, but we can imagine what happened. That here are the hands of that 118-year-old man trembling because it's going to be his son. And as he's there trying to take care of that, he couldn't even do it, that even Isaac had to help him. And he couldn't lift him up on the altar. Even Isaac had to help him to do that. And finally, when God, what God had told Abraham, he did. He took the knife. And it said that Abraham took the knife and as he was ready to go, I want you to understand something. Abraham was committed. The knife was sent to its target. And it wasn't until then that someone caught the hand. It was God himself. who said, Abraham, it is enough. Now, did he do that for himself? Did God test him to that very length? God knows Abraham would have done anything. He did that for the worlds to see. There were no other audience. Nobody was there but Abraham, Isaac, and the entire universe looking on. Not only was the unfallen world was there, but the devil himself was there. Try to keep them from following through. And can you imagine what the devil thought? What is this? No one stopped what God had to do. In that moment when he caught the hand, God said, it is enough. And when they looked, there was a lamb, a ram caught in a thicket that wasn't there before. And they brought the ram and they sacrificed the ram. And Abraham stood on that mountain and God said, now you can see into the heart of of God. Because God showed him down through time that another sacrifice was going to be offered. A son, the only son, the son whom he loved. But this time, nobody caught the knife. God wanted his friend, Abraham, to look into the depths of the heart of God until that moment no one in the entire universe had seen to the depths of God's heart. What is it like to give your son, your only son? You think it wasn't a struggle? And God gave that son on that spot. Do you know what I found out? I found out that where Abraham raised that altar, Jerusalem was built not too many years later. I know my father well enough to know that when that cross was raised, it fell in the hole right where that altar had stood. The Lamb of God sacrificed on the Mount Moriah and no one 
caught the knife. I thank God no one caught the knife. Now, does God look a little different in this story? Do you know that that's what he's trying to do to you? He's trying to get you to see into his heart, to know what God is like, that you will have no doubt about what he wants to do in your life. You will learn to trust him, and God will move you from station to station to station until there is a time when he says, these are my children. Who got them this way? It is I. I am that I am. It is I, Yahweh Jireh, my God, will provide. Father in heaven, what an incredible story. To see the lengths that you would go to to reveal your heart, to reveal your purpose, and to give Abraham that one who is just like me, the opportunity to look into your heart. You don't do that very easily because most people, number one, would not even care to look into your heart and they wouldn't understand but your friend Abraham understood and your friends in this room that are coming to know you will understand as you reveal the heart of a father who was willing to offer his son and to allow him to go through an experience that on the surface you look pretty bad as Jesus cried out to his father to feel that torture of being separated from you. Oh, Father, thank you for what you have done. Thank you for this gift in your son. Thank you for this story that a casual reader will never understand. But as we dwell upon it and say, Father, I don't understand, you will walk with us in the way and our hearts will burn within us as you teach us the things about your love. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't wait till this 11 o'clock service. Ernie is going to tell you of another depth into the heart of God. Abba.